Welcome to Six Feet Deep, where we talk about true crime in story format. That's all we do here. And this is my very first episode, which I'm really excited to finally be getting off the ground after months of setbacks. First, car broke down less than three weeks after I bought it, which was less than happened less than a full week's paycheck, which for which I needed the car, you know, um, catalytic converter repair that, you know, don't have the money to, to do. Then less than a month after that, Apple's update for the monitory, uh, operating system, um, bricked the T2 security chip in my Mac mini which also knocked out the webcam speakers and mic in my Thunderbolt display. Now, if it wasn't for a really good friend of mine who had gifted me a Focusrite Solo uh, Scarlet uh, studio uh, set up with a, a directional condenser mic um, and also a pair of headphones that comes with that, um, I would not have been able to even cobble together this podcast, but as it were, the bricking of my Mac computer that I bought, obviously during better times when we had, you know, money to spend was really, you know, disheartening because it meant that I had to still solve the webcam problem to be able to present, you know, um, to, to get my channel going and, and start presenting these true crime cases. Some of which have, by the way, have never been solved. Some are cold case files. Others have been solved, but are really beyond the pale level of bizarre. Uh, all in all it's, you know, um, I've got a lot of good material. So I was really excited to get this off the ground, but I still had to solve the webcam problem and had to find something that was compatible with OBS, which is what I'm using to, to broadcast. And I had to find something that was compatible with the equipment that I have and that I could afford as somebody who, whose income has effectively been zero, um, except for the three days pay that I was able to earn in January before my car broke down with the catalytic converter problem, followed by the ABS control, which is your steering and your traction control. Um, so I'm finally, you know, getting this podcast off the ground with um, a, a different webcam that isn't as good as the one that I had that worked correctly. So without further ado, please bear with me because this is my very first one and I'm nervous and I wanted it to come out really good. Um, you know, I, I put a lot of, um, effort into, you know, um, trying to learn how to, you know, be a content creator, uh, so that I could take all of these true crimes that I have, you know, knowledge of, that I, you know, had researched, that I had, you know, observed, been a witness to, and in one case, one case, even wrote a book about, um, and self-published it many years ago. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. My name is Jacqueline, and I'll be your host for Six Feet Deep. And today, uh, the crime we're going to be talking about is the murder of one Anthony Milano. Anthony Milano was a commercial artist who had just graduated from art school in, from the Philadelphia's prestigious art college in 1987. And, um, he was... 26 years old. He was looking forward to starting his career. Um, he had a lot of, a lot of talent and he, you know, his parents were very proud of him and his parents 
were um, Vito and Rose Milano, who, you know, they they lived the American dream. I mean, they they came from the working class. Rose was from Brooklyn, New York, and her husband um, Vito was a native of Barry, Italy, and he didn't have the opportunity to go to school beyond um, eight, you know, age eight years old. He had been working as a village barber since he was an eight year old child. So he knew how to cut hair, but in coming to the United States, when he had met Rose, when her family was on vacation over in Italy, she brought him back and they got married and she taught him how to read well enough so that he could pass all of his state licensing exams to get certification so that he could work as a barber. And, uh, you know, so that meant he had to learn English. <laughs> he had to, uh, get his literacy skills up to the level of at least a high school graduate at which he did. He worked very hard and she worked very hard helping him and, you know, they, they started out their lives together in, in the 1950s in this way. Um, so he, he finally became a barber and he, you know, worked real hard. He eventually got his own barber shop where he, he was a proprietor of, of, um, his own barber shop in Levittown, Pennsylvania, which is a, a small blue collar middle-class suburb to Philadelphia. And, he was wildly successful because everybody loved Vita. Everybody loved him. Um, there wasn't anybody who disliked the Milanos. They were the family everybody loved. And they had a boy and a girl. They had a son and a daughter. Um, Anthony Vito Milano, uh, who was born in um, 1961, followed by his sister Anna Marie. And Vito and Rose were very proud of Anthony. From the time he was a little child, he showed, you know, promise of, you know, he was very smart. He learned how to read at a very young age. Um, you know, he was a, a very precocious child. He was very curious. And he was also very sensitive and very inclined towards the, the arts, towards art. Unfortunately, that would end up setting Anthony up to be teased later on, mercilessly, uh, when he was in high school, because he had effeminate qualities. Um, not because he was an artist, but because Anthony harbored a painful secret. In the 1980s, it was very difficult, if not impossible, for young people who were LGBT to come come out, as they say. And Anthony didn't want to disappoint his parents. I mean, his father was an old school Italian guy, and his mom was, you know, <laughs> a traditional Italian housewife. And the last thing Anthony wanted to do was disappoint his parents. So he struggled with this secret, um, a secret that only his sister knew and she swore, you know, that she would never, she would never out him, you know, that this was going to be up to him. And Anthony struggled with this in silence and in a lot of, a lot of pain. The only other people who knew was one or two close friends who were older, middle-aged women from the Bible study class at his parents' church that, you know, he often went and studied with and, um, you know, would often ask them for advice to, to see if he could overcome his being gay. One evening, um, about four months after he graduated from art college, was looking forward to moving into his own apartment in Philadelphia's prestigious Rittenhouse Square, which is known for, at, 
at the time back then, 1987, it was anyway. Don't know about today. It was known for being a, a haven for, you know, people in the, in the arts profession. And Anthony was, you know, had some promising opportunities uh, for work as a commercial artist. Um, and his parents had helped him with, you know, a thousand dollars that was, he was going to use towards the, the first and last month's rent and security deposit. Thousand dollars went a lot further back in 1987 than it does today. Um, so this was a huge deal and Rose and Vito were so proud of him. Um, and Anthony was also very proud of his family. He was proud of his sister, Anna Marie. He was proud, you know, of his father and his mother and, you know, the, the home life that he had. And he desperately, desperately wanted to make sure that his family would never be disappointed in him. So that was the one secret that he never let out to anyone except Anne Marie and one or two women from the Bible study class. Anthony was very soft-spoken. He was very talented. He was very intelligent. He was also very shy. And one night in December of 1987, it was a rainy, cold, miserable, miserable night. Right before Christmas, it was, you know, about... 10 days before Christmas, he had gone to a Bible study class like like he usually did. And um, after the class, like he usually did, he stopped by a little tavern called the Edgeley Inn in Bristol Township for a beer and a sandwich before going home. Now, Bristol is on the Pennsylvania and New Jersey state line. It borders the, the Delaware River. And it's, you know, right next to, to Levittown. So this is all in, in the same, you know, area. So Anthony stops in this bar to have a sandwich and go home. However, that night, deciding to stop at the Edgeley Inn for his sandwich would end up costing him his life. What... Anthony found when he went to the Edgeley Inn was he found two men who targeted him almost from the moment he walked in. And instead of just turning around and leaving to walk out, he thought, well, no, I'm going to have my my sandwich and my my beer and go home. I'm going to mind my own business. And that's what he did. He went in there to have a beer and a sandwich. He wasn't bothering anyone. So he's eating his sandwich, drinking his beer, finishes up, gets ready to leave. When the young bartender, Jimmy Phillips, you know, took his his money and Anthony always tipped well too. Um, And wished Anthony a Merry Christmas. This was right before Christmas. But these two other men that were in the bar, who had been in the bar for several hours at this point, they were drinking and they were getting kind of aggressive, kind of boisterous. And these two men were Richard Laird, age 24, and Richard Laird's buddy, Frank Chester, age 20. Now, Richard Laird, it's hard to tell from this picture of him. This is from his original mugshot in 1988. Richard Laird was the size of Jason Momoa. He was like six foot four. He weighed 240 pounds and he was like, it was built like a brick shit house. Um, and he was also a very aggressive kind of person. While in the bar, you know, I mean, Richard Laird, he was kind of known in the community for being, you know, somebody that was scary. He ran with a motorcycle club known as the breed. 
He was involved with dealing and using meth. Um, he had a history of violence. And he was a very mean, nasty drunk. What happened when he met, when he and Frank Chester, his, his buddy, when they met Anthony Milano in that bar, they didn't let Anthony just leave after Anthony finished his sandwich. They taunted him. They grabbed him by the buttocks. They were, you know, taunting his uh, sexuality and masculinity. They slow danced with each other and pretend made out with each other just to uh, provoke Anthony or something. I, it, whatever their reason was, it wasn't because you know, it, it, they, they were looking to start trouble. And Jimmy Phillips knew this. He had had problems with Richard Laird before. Not so much Frank Chester. But Richard Laird, he had had a lot of problems with before. And Jimmy Phillips pulls, you know, Anthony aside after Anthony, you know, excuses himself to get away from these two guys to go to the bathroom because he just, he's going to go pee, he's going to get on his coat, and then he's going to leave. Pinky promise, right? Jimmy Phillips calls him over and says, hey, come here, kid. Those guys, those two, meaning... Frank Chester and Richard Laird, they're looking to cause trouble. I'll distract them. You just leave. You just get on your coat and just leave. Just leave now. Because they they, they mean you no good. Um, but Richard Laird and Frank Chester had other ideas. What they were doing before Jimmy Phillips called Anthony over to, you know, let him know, hey, I'm, I'm going to help you escape this situation, is they bullied Anthony into buying them drinks, buying them uh, shots, um, and then they mocked him and ridiculed him for his choice of a drink. He didn't want a shot. He, he had his beer and his sandwich. He wanted to go home. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But Richard Laird bullied him into, you know, buying him and Frank Chester and himself shots. So Anthony buys himself a shot of Sambuca and he buys those two guys, you know, whiskey. And Richard Laird wanted another round. And Anthony tried to protest and say, look, I don't want another drink. I don't want another shot. I really just, you know, I just came in here for a sandwich and a beer. I really just want to go home. And because Anthony was small, he was slender. He was smaller than Richard Laird. He wasn't tiny, but he was smaller than six, four. I mean, Anthony Milano was about, uh, five, eight and five, nine and weighed 150 pounds. You know, he wasn't a big man and he was a very mild mannered man. He was very, you know, he he was terrified of confrontation. And after his experiences in, in high school during his senior year, when, you know, kids would tease him and call him, you know, call him names because they suspected that, you know, that he was, he was gay. I mean, it was never proven, but they suspected it. And he just didn't want to be in in a confrontation. He just wanted to leave. But Richard Blair blocked Anthony's path to get to leave the Edgley Inn and said, no, no, yeah, you know, um, you're buying us another drink. So Anthony reluctantly buys Rick Laird and Frank Chester another round. And then that's when Anthony, you know, goes back to, you know, resume talking with Jimmy Phillips, the bartender. And Jimmy's like, look, you know, just, I got your back. Just get on your coat. You can leave now. I'll keep these guys distracted so you can leave. 
Anthony was just about to do that. He turned around to get his coat when he, bam, just about bumped right into Richard Laird, who towered over him by at least, you know, three quarters of a foot. And Richard Laird's like, uh, where do you think you're going? You're giving us, meaning Richard Laird and Frank Chester, you're giving us a ride, right? And he wasn't asking. He was demanding. It wasn't, hey, can you give us a ride? It was, you're giving us a ride, right? And and just staring down and really glaring at, at this poor kid and <laughs> terrifying him. And Anthony's like, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll give you a ride. So in the meantime, Frank and Rick go to get their coats on. And Jimmy says, hey, no, don't leave with these guys. You just go. I'll make sure that you, that, that, that you at least have enough. You have at least one minute to get to your car and, and, and take off. These guys are no good. But Anthony wasn't able to leave because as soon as he tried, Richard Laird was right there. So Anthony had no choice but to leave and let them into his car, which was actually his mother's car that, you know, was, a, you know, a gift, another gift to him to get him, you know, on his feet. Uh, 1976 Chevy Nova. So Richard Laird, Frank Chester, and Anthony Milano pile in to Anthony's 1976 Chevy Nova, and they leave. Now, Richard Laird lived less than one mile from the bar. Richard Laird lived within walking distance of the Edgeley Inn. That's how Jimmy Phillips knew that Richard Laird was up to no good. He didn't need a ride home. He lived within walking distance of the tavern. Um, instead of having Anthony drive him and his buddy Frank Chester back to Rick's apartment, Rick started what ended up being a 45 minute hell ride. He was slapping Anthony around in the car, um, you know, saying, shut up faggot, you know, uh, and giving him turn by turn directions on where he wanted him to go. They went up and down route 13, which, you know, runs right, right alongside the, practically right alongside the Delaware river there stopping for, you know, cigarettes at a seven 11 turning around, uh, going to a gas station, uh, turning around again, going back towards, you know, uh, the other side of, of, of Bristol and finally stopping in the Venice Ashby section of Bristol, which was the, the projects area of, of Bristol township. And it's where, um, the biggest local meth dealer lived a guy named Tommy Maine. So Rick wanted to go to Tommy Maine's to get some meth. At this time, Anthony is just, he's terrified. He's been, he's been slapped around in his car for the better part of 45 minutes. And throughout this hell ride, Anthony did try to leave when Richard ordered him to stop at a 7-Eleven to get cigarettes. When him and Frank Chester hopped out to go get cigarettes, Anthony tried to peel out of the parking lot and in a state of panic, he gunned the gas and he flooded the car. I mean, this remember, this is a 1976 Chevy Nova. These are older cars. They had, you know, uh, if, you, if you 
if you gunned the gas like that, you'd, you'd flood the carburetor out, and you, you wouldn't be, your car would stall, and you wouldn't be able to restart it. Sometimes you'd sit there and wait a few minutes. And that's what happened. So we ended up not being able to get away. And then for trying to leave, um, Richard Laird slapped him around some more. And um, as what came out in, in court later on, when this came to trial, Richard Laird might have even forced Anthony from behind, out of, from behind the wheel of the car into the passenger seat and himself taken over the car. When they stopped at the Venice Ashby section, it was a wooded area across the street from a row of homes that were, you know, the project homes. That were, and one of those project homes was Tommy Main's house. And in this wooded lot, there was nothing. It was just woods. There was no, no path, no street lights. It was very dark, very dark area, very, you know... And this was in a part in 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 an, in, an, in a neighborhood where if somebody screamed for help, nobody was going to call the police. Okay, what happened here is Richard Laird forced Anthony out of the car, and Richard Laird and Frank Chester frog marched him about a hundred feet into the woods in this wooded lot, and Frank Chester, you know, did a couple of karate kicks on Anthony and hit him and Richard Laird uh, hit him some more and the physical beating that he that Anthony suffered was enough to fracture his skull um, it gets worse <laughs> Richard Laird carried one of those knives, those little utility knives with the blades about yo big, the retractable blades that um, that, that you 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 uh, you flip in and out, and you can score linoleum or drywall with. Because Richard Laird worked as as a handyman, so he always carried this this utility knife with him. He pulled out this utility knife. And with this utility knife, he hacked away at Anthony Milano's throat until he almost decapitated him completely. It took 10 minutes for Anthony Milano to, d to die <coughs> from aspirating in his own blood. Um... When the coroner would later do the autopsy on Anthony Milano, the coroner was unable to count the number of slashes to Anthony's throat. His throat was gone. His larynx was gone. From having his throat hacked at with that utility knife, he had been cut so deep that utility knife actually scored the vertebrae in his, um, in his neck. He was almost fully decapitated. Um, it's incomprehensible. And here's the, here's the aerial view. You can see this is from Google. Google Maps, satellite. Now that area is, since Anthony's murder, they've actually, the Bristol Township, cut down a lot of the, the wooded trees there um, because of that crime. When Anthony Milano was discovered, it was the next day. But before that happened, right after Richard Laird hacked away at this kid's throat, Richard Laird and Frank Chester took off on foot. And they ran about a mile to a guy named Pete Carpinona to his apartment uh, over in Lakeview Manor. 
which was about a mile away on foot and, you know, pounded on the door at, you know, demanding to be let in so that Richard Laird could, you know, wash off some of Anthony's blood. He had Anthony Milano's blood all over his coat, his uh, leather, his leather biker jacket, his t-shirt, you know, shoes, his, his, you know, steel tip boots, his hands. And, um, you know, Pete Carpinona's roommate, Frank, uh, Rich Griscavich, which was, who was a friend of Frank Chester's, not Richard Laird's, but Frank Chester's, uh, Rich, Rich Griscavich and Pete Carpinona were not friends with Rick Laird. They were friends with Chester and they were asking Frank, you know, what the hell's going on? And Frank says, you know, we got in a fight and the dude is dead. And Rick Laird spun around and just fixed this malevolent icy glare on Frank and, you know, shut the F up, Frank, and silenced him, you know. Um, This Frank was about the same size as Anthony Milano. And while he was friends with Rick Laird, he was also scared of Rick Laird. He looked up to Rick Laird and wanted to be tough like Rick Laird. But he also was scared to death to cross Rick Laird. I mean, it, it was this weird sort of bond that they had. So um, Rick Laird demands Rich Griscavich to give him a ride home. Him mean, meaning Richard Laird. Now, Rich Griscavich had a motorcycle. He didn't have a car. He had a little motorcycle. He obviously couldn't fit both Frank and Richard Laird on the back of his bike at the same time. So he said, you know, get Richard Laird out of here because Pete Carpinone and Pete Carpinone's fiance, who had just recently given birth, they had a brand new baby. They were engaged to be married. They didn't know, they didn't know this Richard Laird from a can of paint. They didn't like him. You know, they meet this guy, he's big, he's you know, bullying, you know, <laughs> bullying, you know, Frank's friends and, and shows up and covered in blood, you know, and they don't know him, you know, from Adam. So Pete Carpenter was like, Hey, Rich, meaning Rich Griscavich, you know, get, get him, meaning Rick, La- Richard Laird, get him the hell out of here. So Rich Griscavich is, you know, grabs his motorcycle helmet and, you know, after Rick, Richard Laird washes up, you know, uh, a superficial wash up at the sink to wash the blood off of himself, to wash it off of his, his uh, leather jacket and his hands and his face, his, you know, his chest, he leaves and he gets on the back of Rich Griscavage's motorcycle and Rich Griscavage drives him home while Richard Laird is being driven home. Pete Carpinona asks Frank Chester what the hell had happened. And Frank started to tell him, he said, (laughs) uh, you know, it started out where, you know, it was just fun and games. We were just kind of taunting this guy. We were picking on him because he was a, you know, and this is using Frank Chester's exact words because he was a quote faggot and Rick started effing with him. And then, you know, things escalated and Rick flipped out and killed him. And I'm scared because if I go to the cops, my fingerprints were in Anthony Milano's car. I'm going to automatically get blamed for it. And if I go to the cops, I'm dead because Rick Laird is somebody you don't mess with. He'll kill me. If I go to the, if I talk, he'll kill me. Um, by this time, Rich Griscavich, you know, came back to the apartment, gave Frank Chester a ride home. Well, gave not home, but back to Rick Laird's apartment because Rick Laird's pregnant fiance was Frank Chester's cousin, Barbara Ann Parr. 
So that's where Frank Chester asked Rich Griscavage to take him. He didn't ask him to take him to the Bristol Township Police to immediately report a homicide because he was scared of his buddy. He didn't ask Rich Griscavage to take him back to his own apartment that he had. He told Rich Griscavage to take me back to Rick Laird's place. So, you know, at this point, Barbara Ann Parr is upset. She was seven months pregnant. She had had a difficult pregnancy. And she didn't understand why her boyfriend was coming home this late and why his boots were were dirty, covered in mud and blood. So she scrubs his his boots off in in, in the sink. And she's all upset. Richard Laird goes into their bedroom and he passes out. A few minutes later, bang, bang, bang. Frank Chester's pounding on her door. And uh, at this point, Barbara's really upset. She lets him in. She's like, damn it, Frank, every time the two of you go out together, he gets into trouble. And she was so mad, she threw a motorcycle helmet at him. Oh, you know, Frank's like, you know, where's Rick? Where's Rick? And, you know, Barbara said, well, he's in the bedroom. He just went in there and passed out. Now, meanwhile, there was another person at at Rick Laird's apartment, and that was another friend of Frank Chester's, a, a girl by the name of Gail Gardner, who was down on her luck. Uh, she was pregnant. Her boyfriend was in jail and her car was broke down. So she was staying there couch surfing basically until she could get help with a ride back to Philadelphia, which was about an hour away uh, from Rick, where Rick and Barbara Ann lived. So Gail Gardner is now fully awake and she's like, you know, what, what's going on? What happened? And, uh, you know, Frank's like, you know, I'll I'll explain later. Well, Frank goes into the bedroom, tries to wake up Richard Laird. And he's like, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He's more worried about what Richard Laird is going to do than anything. And, um, you know, uh, Richard Laird, you know, tells him basically to get the F out of his bedroom and, you know, just... Just shut up, you know, you're ruining my life. Well, <laughs> and Frank goes out to the living room, sits up with Gail Gardner. They sit up, they pull an all-nighter. Barbara Ann Parr ends up going back to the bedroom with, you know, where Rick is. And Frank and Gail are still sitting on the couch, and they're still up and they're still talking by, you know, later on that morning when Barbara Ann and Richard Laird, you know, wake up and during the course of of those wee morning hours Frank Chester told Gail Gardner sort of the same thing he told Pete Carpinona that um, there was this quote faggot who was in the bar and they were they were having some fun with him but then Rick took things a little too far and you know, during this hell ride home or what was supposed to be a ride home, Rick flipped out and killed the guy. And Gail, you know, says to Frank, well, did you hurt him too? And he says, uh, well, I just kind of shoved him to, you know, push him up to push him out of the way. So, so Rick wouldn't, you know, hurt him too bad. Well, maybe I punched him a little. Maybe if I punched him a little, Rick would calm down and the whole situation would be diffused. And At this point, Gail Gardner is... She's wanting to get the hell out of there, but has to wait for a ride. So in the morning, when Barbara Ann and Rick wake up, 
They get dressed. Rick takes his, his leather jacket and his biker boots that still had remnants of Anthony's blood on it. Throws them in, in, a, um, in a garbage bag. Makes a phone call to his brother who lives in the neighboring community of Levittown. Uh, his brother Mark. And arranges to meet with Mark for lunch um, that day. Where they will discuss what to do about the evidence of the crime. Uh, in the car, in Rick's car, um, Rick and Barbara Ann and... Barbara Ann's little boy from, you know, she had a, a nine-year-old child from a prior relationship. They called him Little David. So Barbara and Little David and, and, and Frank and Gail Gardner all pile into Rick's Pontiac. And while they're driving, you know, on their way to Frank Chester, they're, they're going to drop off Frank Chester and Gail Gardner first. They weren't going to take Frank with them to meet with Rick's brother, Mark. So while they're driving, Rick pulls out the, you know, the knife because, you know, Frank's saying, you know, my fingerprints were in that car. You know, he's, he kept worrying about his fingerprints being in Anthony's car. And Rick pulls out this box cutter, this, this utility knife, and he flicked the blade in and out and said, no evidence, no crime, no weapon, no crime. And he throws the utility knife out of the window, off the, 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 you know, over an overpass into the Neshemini Creek down below. Drops off Frank and Gail at Frank's apartment. And he, he continues on with Barbara Ann and little David on the way to Levittown to meet with Mark to have pizza and discuss what to do about you know, concealing the, the evidence of what he had done the night before. He takes his the bag full of his bloodied clothing and throws it in the dumpster behind, you know, the strip mall there where he had met with Mark. And meanwhile, Frank Chester is back at his apartment Gail Gardner still doesn't have a ride. Frank doesn't have, you know, a, a car that's running. His car's broke down or something. Or, I don't know if it was broke down or he, he didn't have one that was legal to drive or whatever. So at, the, at this point, you know, Gail is, you know, having to wait again, hoping that another one of Frank's friends will stop by and she can get a ride back to Philadelphia from Bristol. So Gail says, now go, let's go through this again, Frank. You know, last night was really crazy and I'm trying to understand, you know, what happened? Tell me what happened. And, you know, again, Frank recounted this, this whole thing with, you know, um, him and Rick taunting Anthony in the bar and they were just trying to have some fun. Um, and then Rick forcing Anthony to give them a ride. And that during the course of this ride, things got out of hand and Rick flipped out and killed him. He didn't take any responsibility for his part in this. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, um, you know, I, you know, had to go with, right, ran, you know, to Pete Carpinona's apartment to try to get a ride home from my buddy, Rich Griscavich, you know, to get a ride back to Rick Laird's, you know, because he wasn't going to leave Gail Gardner there at Rick Laird's, you know. So Gail is trying to process all of this. Meanwhile, a couple other friends stop by. One of them is Pete Carpinona, whom, you know, whose apartment, you know, Frank had and Rick Laird had been to just the night before. 
And another friend, Alan Hilton, you know, and another guy named Mike DeWitt. These were all friends of Frank Chester's. None of these people were friends with Richard Laird. They were all friends with Frank Chester. And Frank is, is panicking and he's saying, you know, what should I do? What should I do? I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Frank Chester's, you know, a 20-year-old kid. Not exactly, you know, operating with both oars in the water. Um, and they said, look, you know, Alan Hilton says, look, you know, if you really are innocent and you didn't have anything to do with this, you should just go to the cops and come clean. Go to the cops. Report what happened. And that's what the others told him, too. And one by one, all these friends left. And one of them, you know, gave, you know, Gail a ride back to Philadelphia. And Frank was, you know, he was scared. He didn't want to go to the cops because he knew he wasn't totally innocent. And yet, you know, uh, he wasn't, you know, total, he wasn't 100% at fault, but he wasn't totally innocent. He was swept up in this mess with this friend of his and it was a mess. But he was responsible. He hit the guy. He hit the victim. He made fun of Anthony along with his buddy Rick. He he didn't say, um, look, Rick, you know, this, this is enough. He didn't, you know, Ch- Frank Chester bragged about being a martial artist, about, ha- you know, having, you know, a couple of belts in karate. Well, you know, Frank Chester was built about the same size as Anthony Milano. So instead of using th- those karate moves on Anthony Milano, he could have used those karate moves on Rick Laird and disarmed them and knocked that utility knife out of his hand, you know, and then run, you know, or grabbed Anthony and, you know, thrown Anthony in the car and, you know, the two of them go to the cops or, or something, you know, it, it, martial artist, you know, you don't just stand there and watch your buddy hack somebody to death, right? But he did, you know, this is, and this all came out in court. Now, how, how, how Richard Laird and Frank Chester got caught is because Frank Chester had told all of his other friends about what had happened and tried to pin the whole thing on Rick Laird. And one of the guys that he talked to, a guy named Mike DeWitt, um, who was who came by to show Frank his new car from, you know, that he just got. And Frank says, Hey, can you give me a ride to the Poconos? I got a dead deer I gotta take care of and the dead deer, of course, being Anthony Milano. And this this happened while all, all the friends were at Frank Chester's apartment. They were discussing what to do. And Mike DeWitt was like, uh, nah, I don't think so. I think I'm out of here. And Mike DeWitt, you know, gave Gail a ride home. And they left. Now, later on that night, there was a fire from where Anthony's car was parked on Ashby Avenue. 100 feet away from where he was killed. The car was set on fire. And you could see this, you know, uh, as the sun started to go down, you could, you, you could see this fire. Um, Bristol Township and Fire Department were called. They responded to the fire. Um... They found that the car was registered to Rose Milano, Levittown, it's Anthony's mother. And then 100 feet into the woods, and this was by, by this time, it's, you know, it's already dark. It gets dark early in December, right? So they're already, you know, it's already dark. And they're looking for, you know, clues as to, you know, what happened to the driver of the car, who clearly wasn't with the car. And one of the officers walked into the wooden lot and lo and behold, there was Anthony's corpse. So he was, 
you know, dead underneath one of the trees with his throat hacked out. (laughs) They had to sit up with the body all night until the body could be photographed in broad daylight by forensics team in the morning. And the cop who found Anthony uh, coincidentally had been at the Edgeley Inn you know, a few hours before uh, the murder happened. He had stopped in to ask the patrons in the bar if they knew anything about such and such a car. There was a reported stolen car that was supposedly left in, in the lot. And he remembered seeing Richard Laird, Frank Chester, and Anthony Milano leaving together um, because he was sitting out outside of the bar, still filling out his reports and his paperwork when Rick and, and, and Frank and, and Anthony all piled into Anthony's you know, Chevy Nova. And Char- Officer McGeegan was like, oh, I know that kid. That's the kid who was with these other two screwballs uh, at the bar. And he thought that it was kind of weird because Anthony Milano did not look like the kind of guy that would be associating with somebody like Richard Laird. You know, he, he had no criminal record. He, you know, he wasn't a biker. He wasn't a tough guy. He was, you know, a very effeminate guy. He was, um, uh, he always dressed nice. He, you know, very quiet, very mild mannered, not involved with any criminal activity at all. And, um, you know, Geekin was like, hey, you know, this, this didn't fit. And I thought this was weird last night. Now I see what happened. You know, they baited him, which is what did happen. So when they, they wait, the you know, forensics team comes, and, you know, when, when the sun comes up, and they photograph the body, they take the body, they take Anthony's body away. The coroner, uh, the pathologist, the Bucks County pathologist, um, does it, you know, complete, you know, report on him. Um, and found that, you know, this is what he died from. He, had he not died from his throat being hacked out, he would have died from the blows to his head that he sustained from Frank Chester um, pulling his, you know, karate punches and kicks on him. His brain was swelling in his head. His skull was fractured. If he would have survived, if his throat wouldn't have been cut, he would have been a vegetable on life support. He would have never, ever been able to walk, talk, chew gum, anything on his own ever. Now, McGeegan, being the officer who responded to a stolen car complaint the night before and remembered seeing the three men in the Edgeley Inn, he already had a good idea of where to start looking to see who would, who was the last person to have seen this kid alive. And he suspected that the last person was not himself. That it was one or both of the men whom piled into Anthony Milano's car to leave the bar at quarter after two, after last call. So, at this point, Frank Chester is scared. And he's, you know, running and asking his, his other friends, what do I do, you know? He calls Rick Laird. He says, you know, what are you going to do? Um, Rick Laird, you know, he at one point he has a, you know, Rick Laird calls him at his apartment while some of his other friends are there. And Frank tells these friends, oh, that was Rick. His brother Mark is going to take care of the car. As in, Mark was supposedly, you know, according to what Frank was telling the others in his apartment that Mark was going to destroy the car, burn the car up. 
and you know the car was burned but they never proved you know who did that you know it could have been could have been Rick who did it you know that, that was you know Mark was never charged in in connection with that crime but one by one some of these friends started to get suspicious of Frank's story and some of these friends started to you know call the police and say hey um something's not right Frank Chester found himself approached by a policeman after enough of these calls from friends asking, you know, what they should do. Because at this point, what was being relayed to them was really hearsay. None of these people saw the crime. None of these people were involved. None of these people even knew who Richard Laird was. They did, they, you know, they weren't part of Richard Laird's circle and he wasn't part of theirs. Um, so district attorney, Alan Rubenstein had a rule. He was a newly elected district attorney and he was, you know, chomping at the bit to not flub, you know, an important homicide case. So he had this rule that anytime there was a homicide, the, the, his detectives, you know, in Bristol Township, you know, would have, you know, would have to, uh, would have to call him, notify him. And they did. So Rubenstein formulated a plan for how to get, you know, these guys who were responsible. Um, and his plan was, was, was kind of brilliant. But it's kind of entrapment, too. What Rubenstein did was he told Detective Dykes in Bristol Township, you know, set Frank up, you know, pull him over for a traffic thing. I don't care what you got to do. Get him to come in and then question him. It's apparent that one of these men is a talker and he's going to talk his way right into a jail cell and he's going to talk his buddy along with him. This is what Rubenstein was banking on happening. And that's what did happen. Um, Bristol police pulled Frank Chester over for, you know, taillight being out. They have Frank come down to, to the, you know, the, without raising any, any, um, suspicion. You know, they're not tipping their hand. They're not letting Frank know that they're suspecting him in this murder. They just say, now just come down and clear up some traffic tickets. You're good. You're yeah, it's all good. Just, yeah. We just need you to come down and take care of some outstanding tickets. So he did. And while he was down there, he paid his tickets. He t- gets ready to leave. And one of the detectives says, hey, Frank, um, it was a Chevy Nova that was set on fire and, you know, a kid whose throat was, you know, slashed, he was killed. He wouldn't happen to know anything about that. And Frank Chester was, mm I, I don't know. Well, I, I sort of know from what I read in the newspapers. Well, maybe I know a little more. <laughs> After gaining Frank Chester's trust, Bristol detectives were able to get Frank to tell them what he knew. And they said, he said, look, okay, I was scared, but this is honest to gosh what happened. Um, I got dropped off and I don't know what Anthony and Rick did after they dropped me off, but I wasn't there. And Detective Dyke says, well, you see, that, that isn't going to work. You know, because we we have, you know, uh, a witness. It was one of their, is Frank's friends. who says, hey, you know, you came to the guy's apartment after this happened. Well, let's go over this again. So, of course, you know, Frank's like, okay. He finally gets it down to admitting to being at the scene but he didn't admit to physically attacking Anthony. He, you know, basically said Richard Laird 
was, you know, 100% responsible for attacking Anthony. And uh, Detective Dyke says, okay, um, tell you what, Frank, um, can you help us? <laughs> can you help us nail Richard Laird? Because what we would really need you to do is, number one, we would need you to pass a polygraph test so that, you know, you can be cleared as okay to testify, you know, and we would need you to, you know, to come in and, you know, we'll, we'll formulate a plan. You know, we, we need you to help us get Richard Laird. And Frank's like, okay. <laughs> he thinks he's helping the police. He thinks the police are his buddies. He thinks that he's off the hook. Except that's not what happened. When Frank goes in for the polygraph test, um, he gets really nervous, which is understandable. Completely understandable. And he says, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to, if, if, you know, he, he says he's willing to get Richard Laird to admit to his role in the murder of Anthony Milano, if they could record a, a telephone conversation between himself and Richard Laird, you know, he says, I, I can do that. You know, when, when that is suggested to him by the detectives, Frank was all for that. He thought he could get Richard Laird to, you know, uh, bust himself on the phone, except, uh, didn't quite work out that way. Richard Laird was kind of shrewd, street smart. Um, he knew that you don't talk about a crime that you commit with a co-conspirator on the phone. His days of running with the breed and dealing in meth taught him that. You know, you don't do that. So when Frank called Rick in the presence of these detectives thinking, oh boy, here's my chance to clear my name. And uh, the first thing Rick says, you know, he, he, Frank's like, you know, I'm, I'm scared um, because I'm, you know, the cops are, you know, have approached me and they're asking questions. And Rick's like, Rick says, you know, what do you, what do you mean? You just don't say anything, you know? And Frank's like, well, yeah, but what should I do if, you know, and what if that? And Richard Laird's like, hey, look, you know, uh, just, just tell him that you, you don't know, you know? He says, just tell him, hey, you're trying to pin a homicide on me. He goes, you know, he goes, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I don't want anybody pinning a homicide on me either. You know, I didn't kill anybody. Richard Laird actually said that on the phone that was recorded, uh, the phone call, uh, with Frank Chester. Now, instead of Frank Chester saying, you know, what do you mean? You killed him or you cut his throat. You know, Frank Chester didn't utter a protest. He just said, yeah, all right. And this was, you know, in the presence of the, of the Bristol police. So two more attempts were made to, you know, get, you know, Frank to, to see if they could get, uh, Richard Laird to incriminate himself to Frank, um, over the phone. And that didn't really work out to the way Frank Chester expected because what ended up happening is they started just talking about like they were just going to go shopping for Christmas presents. And, uh, they were referring to the murder of Anthony Milano as being less serious than accidentally running over a stray dog. So the, the, the police, you know, um, they had enough at this point, they had enough probable cause just on the behavior of, of the two men. Um, you know, to go 
and and arrest them both. And, you know, one last time, they were going to have Frank, you know, come in for the polygraph and do one last, uh, one last call, one last wiretap call to Richard Laird. But then Frank disappears. He runs away. He's scared. And um, he wasn't picked up until New Year's Eve. Richard Laird, on the other hand, was apprehended in a motel room about seven miles up the road on December 24th, on Christmas Eve. He was with his brother Mark and his girlfriend Barbara Parr, who by this point was, you know, pretty pregnant, um, and little David, you know, the police, you know, grab Richard Laird and he was arrested wearing nothing but a pair of the long John bottoms that he had on no shirt, just socks and long John. So Richard Laird, you know, puts on his, his boots and, you know, a, a coat over his bare chest and gets, you know, hauled in and gets arrested. And then, you know, a few days later, Frank Chester is picked up and he's arrested too. Both men were charged with, you know, capital murder. They were charged with kidnapping. They were charged with first degree murder. And they were charged with aggravated assault. Under Pennsylvania state law, kidnapping is defined as being removed a substantial distance from where you originally were without your consent or against your will doesn't have to be removed across state lines. It doesn't have to be that you are knocked out and dragged out to a vehicle and thrown in against your, like, like in the movie Taken or something like that. No, it could be being forced to drive somebody else who's, you know, coercing you or slapping you around or threatening to beat you up. Who's in your car and forcing you to drive them around. Even if you don't even leave the county, that under Pennsylvania state under under Pennsylvania crime statute, that constitutes kidnapping. The murder happened in conjunction with the kidnapping, which made it a capital crime, a capital murder offense, which carries a death penalty in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, when Frank and Rick finally have to, you know, appear for trial. Uh, it's May of, of 1988, you know, five months later. In the meantime, the Milano family is absolutely devastated. They are just devastated. They are devastated by what happened to their son. And Anna Marie, who was Anthony's sister, I mean, they were, they were so close. And I mean, it was just, you know, unthinkable to her that this had happened to her brother. And the, the whole family was just completely devastated. And while, you know, other people were, were picking out Christmas decorations and Christmas presents, Rose and Vito Milano had to meet with an undertaker and pick out a suit for Anthony to be buried in. And they chose the blue, the dark blue suit that they had bought him for his graduation from art school. And that would be the suit that he would be buried in. You know, needless to say, the, the Milanos were just devastated. When Rick Laird and Frank Chester are finally brought to, to court, into the Bucks County Courthouse, uh, five, six months later, um, you know, the Milanos are just, it, it's all they can do to, uh, to, to even be able to, to attend and they have to, and, you know, they were supported by their daughter and the district attorney and had to be physically helped. You know, uh, they were just, they were old and they were just, they just had their whole world 
torn asunder by what happened to their son. And in Anna Marie's case, her brother. And during the trial, throughout the trial, Richard Laird was sneering at the reporters. He was sneering at, you know, this was during a time when, remember, this is 1988. There, there was no such thing as hate crime laws being applied to LGBT people. LGBT, L, L, gay people were not included in hate crime, you know, for hate crime protection. And it was considered acceptable to say, well, it was just a, just a fag, blah, blah, blah. who cares? And that was the attitude that Rick Laird had. Well, he was just a fag. He's just a dead fag. So we had the Philadelphia Gay News Network down there. You had, you know, the Bristol uh, Township, the Bucks County Courier, you know, all the major, you know, news media back then. Now, they, they also didn't have cell phones. They didn't have smartphones. They didn't have internet back then. So, you know, this... It was an entirely different era. So when Richard Laird, you know, is, is entering the courtroom and he's, he's this big guy who towers over most people, you know, and he starts sneering at the reporters and, and, and he sneered, he saw some gay gay rights people there and he sneered at them and he, you know, made comments in the court, uh, telling the bail if he wanted, you know, uh, he didn't, he wanted to, wanted a bulletproof vest in case, you know, the gay, the gay lib people, uh, tried to kill him because those people, you know, were infiltrating everything. He actually said that. And he requested that his kids from his estranged ex-wife Joanne, you know, be moved uh, away from the, so from where the, the, the Philadelphia Gay News Network reporters were sitting so that his kids wouldn't, quote, catch anything from those homos. So that those homos wouldn't give anything to Joanne that their, their kids could catch. I mean, he just, you know, blurted all this stuff out. Um... He was very off-putting, you know, to the jury. He was not somebody that, you know, jury could sympathize with at, at all. In the meantime, this is how Vito Milano learns that his son, his only son, was gay. And Vito never believed it. Rose never believed it. These were elderly people born, you know, in a different era. They were born in the 1920s, grew up in the 30s and 40s, you know, got married in their middle-aged years in the in their 50s, in the 1950s, had their two kids in the early 60s, and they were so, they were nothing but proud of their children. Anthony being gay was not something Vito or Rose were able to wrap their head around or believe. They, they just thought that these two men just decided that they were going to target their son and kill him. You know, because they thought he was gay. Because they they didn't like the way he looked. They didn't like the way he walked. And because they didn't like his style, they killed him. And District Attorney Alan Rubenstein basically presented that case in those exact words. You know, whether or not Anthony's parents would have been accepting of him being gay had he not been killed and had the opportunity to come out and tell them on his own time in his own time as much as his parents loved him I I don't I don't see that they would have disowned him I I don't believe that that they would have 
they don't strike they don't strike me as those type of people. They they just had nothing but love for the for both of their kids, for both their son and their daughter, and were always beaming with pride, especially over Anthony. But uh, they they never believed that Anthony was was gay. And after you know a week of testimony where Richard Laird basically pointed the finger at his co-defendant, Frank Chester, who basically pointed his finger back at Richard Laird, saying, no, he did it, no, he did it. You know, the jury convicted both of them of doing it and gave them both the death penalty. And it was the very first case in all of U.S. history where anybody got, you know, uh, convicted of capital murder and, and got sentenced to death in connection with a hate crime targeting somebody who was LGBT. You know, and this happened before LGBT people were even included in hate crime laws. This happened in 1988. That is how horrified the jurors were when they saw what these two guys did to Anthony Milano who had done nothing to them. He didn't provoke them. He didn't go into the bar and, and start, you know, a fight with them or, or make a pass at them or initiate any unwelcome communication with them at all. He went in, sat down by himself to have a beer and a sandwich. That was all. A beer and a sandwich. After a Bible study class. I have a beer and a sandwich. A sandwich. Nobody deserves to be carved up like a piece of tenderloin. for the worst reason in the world, which is no reason whatsoever. And the jury saw this. They, the judge saw it. The, I, I, the pictures from the crime scene were so horrific that Anthony's parents and sister had to be escorted from the courtroom when it was time to show the crime scene photos to the jury. It was just too much. And although they were sentenced to death, and they, you know, they were convicted and they were sentenced to death, the Milanos, it, the, the nightmare didn't end there for the Milano family. The nightmare had just begun. Rose Milano ended up dying. She, you know, with between what happened with her son and coming down with a chronic, you know, a terminal illness, she had lost the will to live and she died in 1993. She died just, you know, five years after losing, after losing her son, her boy, her baby boy. That was her pride and joy, the light of her life that left just Vito and Anna Marie. Anna Marie suffered trauma and depression throughout her life because of this. You know, she, you know, her only brother murdered for no reason. She never married. She worked at a series of, you know, jobs, you know, that were typical working class kind of jobs. She never went to further, you know, she had given, she had given up hope in life. Because of losing her brother in such a horrific manner. And Vito, he, uh, he never got over it either. What happened after Rick Laird and Frank Chester were convicted, they began the appeals process, the post-conviction appeals process, where they would, would appeal their death penalty sentence. And that could take years and years and years and years, which it did. 
And finally, you know, in late 1990s, early 2000s, Richard Laird wins an appeal to have his conviction and first sentence thrown out and to get granted a new trial on the grounds that his trial attorney, his defense attorney at the original trial, failed or neglected to bring up the mitigating circumstances of Richard Laird having a learning disability from suffering traumatic brain injury from having a fractured skull from an injury when he was a teenager, that Richard Laird had mitigating circumstances due to having been sexually molested by his biological father and beaten badly by his biological father, and that all this served as a a, a mitigating factor. Well, a lot of people had, you know, a problem with that. Because Richard Laird approached Anthony Milano in the bar. Anthony didn't approach him. Okay. The witnesses, other patrons in the bar. You know, there was one or two other people in the bar who were there when Anthony had come in. And you, Jimmy Phillips, who was the, you know, the bartender, was a family-run tavern. And Jimmy Phillips was, I guess, the son of the owners who worked there. And so he worked there for his parents in their tavern. And they all said, hey, well, look, you know, Anthony came in, sat down, just ordered his sandwich, and these guys bullied him into buying them drinks, into giving them a ride. You know, and all these people, including the friends that Frank Chester ran to and, and you know, told about his involvement with the murder, they were all called in by the prosecution. They all, you know, uh, testified on, on the prosecution's behalf. And Rick Laird did not help his own case with some of the really nasty, vicious things that he had to say about gays in court, right there in front of everybody. He was calling the, the people from the Philadelphia Gay News Network, uh, you know, the gay lib people and the homos that are going to get them. And <laughs> he didn't do himself any favors there. And, um, you know, he was really put off-putting to the jury. And, you know, the 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 worst of it was, was that the Milanos had to sit there and hear all this. And this is when Richard Laird was not throwing them, you know, an icy, intimidating, if looks could kill kind of glare at them. As if, you know, it's their fault that he's being tried for murder. You know, you... So, you know, I mean, I mean, this was a, a guy who really was, uh, he was a real um, vicious person. And he was scary. And he was big. And he had a history of violence. And this judge in, in, in the federal circuit court, Judge Jan Dubois, later rules in the, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, that, you know, nope. Richard Laird is entitled to a whole new trial. He didn't get a fair trial because his defense law attorney never raised these issues about, you know, his ADHD, his learning disabilities, his traumatic brain injury, his being a victim of child sexual abuse at the hands of his own dad. You know, which that wasn't raised at the original trial. Now, there's a couple reasons why that might not have been. Back then... Males were not <laughs> allowed by society. I mean, it was just not allowed to say you were sexually abused by a man, especially by your own father. That would have sti- you know, stigmatized him back then. It would have been too traumatic for him to bring that up in court. 
And even if he would have, he would not have been forgiven for, he would not have been given a free pass for killing Anthony Milano. Anyway, because it's not like Anthony Milano, you know, physically overpowered him and tried to force some sort of non-consensual, you know, contact with him. Yeah, this... Richard Laird was clearly the aggressor here all the way around. Um, you know, so the, the circuit judge, you know, overturned Laird's conviction. Laird ended up, you know, getting another trial, you know, and that trial was in 2007. And there he is, 2007. And you can see that he stands about a, a head over these other guys, these sheriff deputies that are escorting him in. So in 2007, you know, roughly, you know, 20 years after, you know, the original trial and after the, the murder, he goes through, you know, the whole process. And this time, his defense attorney, which is a different attorney. These are different lawyers. These are guys from the Capital Defenders Association. They specialize in defending people facing the death penalty. Okay? Um, they're a coalition of lawyers who are opposed to the death penalty, and they represent death row inmates. Can they represent all of them? No, because they're largely volunteer. So they're working free grata. Okay. Um, but these guys, you know, the, the, the Philadelphia Defenders Association, they don't joke around. They don't bring a stick to a gunfight. These were some really good lawyers. And they brought all this evidence that, you know, um, was not brought up at the first trial about Richard Laird having a learning disability, having traumatic brain injury from having a skull fracture as a result of physical abuse, you know, from when he was a kid and from the sexual abuse that he suffered, you know, from his dad. Lawyers brought all this up. All of it. His brother Mark testified and, you know, affirmed it that, you know, that he had witnessed this, that this wasn't, you know, made up that, you know, they witnessed it. And once again, district attorney, who this time wasn't, uh, <laughs> um, somebody with a lot of drama and flair. She was a very subdued layback, but didn't bring a stick to a gunfight kind of a prosecutor. Um, that was Michelle Henry. She brings out a projector, shows the court on slides on a big screen so that the, the jury and everybody in the courtroom could see, you know, um, the scene of the crime, Anthony's bloody clothes, Anthony's, you know, mutilated corpse, everything, everything. And she just very methodically, you know, is it fair to say this? Is it fair to say that? Did you do this? Did you do that? No badgering, just very direct bang, bang, bang. And those pictures said a thousand words and those thousand words said that Richard Laird was a very dangerous guy and the jury, you know, again, second time around, they, you know, convicted him. And what was really horrible is that the Milano, well, Rose Milano had already died by this time. She died in 1993. But, Vito and Anna Marie were still alive and they had to go through this all over again. They, they were sitting, you know, right there in the spectator section of the court and they had to relive all of this. Of course, you know, when the, the slides were, sh were put up, you know, showing the, you know, the, the gruesome crime scene, the bailiff, of course, had to escort them out because it was too traumatic for them. But they had to sit through and listen to um, all this testimony again. Now, this time, Richard Laird wasn't um, calling, you know, 
anybody from the Philadelphia Gay News Network who, you know, their reporters were there again. He wasn't calling them, you know, the, the homo squad or uh, the gay lib people or, you know, uh, 20 years and he learned to bite his tongue a little bit, I think. Um, but he did on occasion turn around and throw some very vicious stares at Vito, at, at an elderly Vito Milano and his daughter, Anna Marie. I'm talking the if looks could kill, the Milanos would have been dead. And how do I know this? Because I was there. I covered that trial. I wrote and self-published a book on it, Eyes of a Monster. This guy really had the eyes of a monster. And I saw, I saw I saw those eyes. And when Vito and Anna Marie saw those eyes, they saw the same eyes that their son, their brother saw as he drew his last breath when his throat was being hacked out in 1987 in a desolate wooded lot in Bristol Township. Richard Laird was convicted again. He was sentenced to death again. So he starts the appeal process all over. In the meantime, Frank Chester, who also had an appeal going, he was appealing on the grounds that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't the aggressor and, you know, he was kind of, his participation in the crime was coerced. And he was unaware that Richard Laird was going to completely go around the bend and hack this guy's throat out. And that, you know, Frank Chester really did want to help the police and he really did feel sorry for, you know, to the extent of his involvement in the case. So, because he was tried in 1988 together with Rick. They were both tried together. They, you know, their motions for severance were denied in the 1988 trial. The fact that Richard Laird was granted a new trial meant that Frank Chester would be too. Well, the prosecution stepped in and said, no, no more. We can't put the Milanos through this again. We will agree not to seek the death penalty. If you withdraw all rights to appeal, all rights to apply for parole, you agree that you're going to stay your ass in prison for the rest of your natural life. No parole, no pardon, no clemency. You're going to not, you're going to be taken off death row, but you're never ever seeing the outside of a prison again. And Frank Chester agreed. He said that, okay. So he, you know, he copped a plea deal. And in addition to that, he had to also agree that at any further appeals of Richard Laird's, that if, if the state needed to, you know, produce his, his testimony again, that he would be more than willing to cooperate, that he would cooperate fully and, you know, to, to, to the fullest extent possible. Frank Chester agreed. So Rick is now going through the appeal system. And this is what he looks like today. He's in his 60s. He's in his early 60s. Or maybe late 50s. I don't know. I'm 55. Let's see. He's He was four years older than me, five years older than me. Yeah, late 50s. That would be about right. This was a picture of him, courtesy of Pennsylvania inmate locator, uh, Department of Corrections inmate locator. Um, he's still on death row. He's going through the appeals process all over again. 
And this is what he looks like as of 2020. Frank Chester, this is what he, you know, again, courtesy of, of Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, inmate locator, this is what he looks like as of 2020. You know, um, both men obviously still alive. Now here's the tragedy. Vito Milano is not. Anna Marie is not. Vito Milano died on his 84th birthday in 2012. Anna Marie, who was just overcome with grief, she had lost her brother, she had lost her mother, and now she lost her dad. And she had never married. She died in her home in Ben Salem, which is near that area of Bristol, Levittown, Doylestown, you know, Bucks County. She died in her home in October of 2015. She was 52 years old. The entire family, the entire Milano family was utterly destroyed. Utterly destroyed. And that wraps up, you know, my very first um, podcast episode of on Six Feet Deep, where all we do is is uh, talk about true crime in a storytelling format. So if you like that kind of content and you would like more cases covered, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, and tip of the hat to John Ballin for this one. Offer to take the like button out on a date, but then take them to a restaurant that's already closed. Bye. See you.